How y'all doing? This is Pastor Hagwood once again. Again, Pastor of First Mount Zion Missionary Baptist Church here in Charlotte, North Carolina, where we are exalting Christ to restore, renew, and rebuild people to serve the kingdom of God. Amen. This is our second Bible uh, Sunday School lesson on today. Um, doing this a little bit differently. Um, I do have a little bit of a word afterwards. Um, um, it won't be won't be very long. It'll be very, very quick uh, because uh, I want to get these two lessons to get us caught up in our Sunday School lessons. Uh, and so forth. If you're just joining us, you can go back and look at last week's lesson, which I just did an hour ago, uh, which is now posted on Facebook, and you can watch that, and then also be live with us here now, or you can watch this later on Facebook, uh, on Facebook, on our channel, um, on our Facebook page at First Mount Zion Missionary Baptist Church, uh, First Mount Zion Missionary Baptist Church on Facebook. So with that, we thank God for you on today. We thank God for all that you continue to do. Uh, God continues to do and even in our midst. Our, our, this Sunday school lesson is called Ezekiel Street Preacher to the Exiles. Okay, Ezekiel Street Preacher to the Exiles. And so I'm going to go through that lesson uh, on today. Uh, just thank God for all of you once again. I know folks who will be joining us. Um, and forgive me for the technical difficulties on the last uh, feed, but I think I kind of see what's going on. If my video goes out and that timer is still going and my camera light is still on, that means we're still live. So I don't need to see myself in regards to actually doing the video um, on Facebook in and of itself. So we're going through this lesson on today. We'll take another hour in regards to that and uh, let God lead us thusly. Um, let us go to the Lord um, in prayer before we get started. Let us pray. Most eternal and all wise God, our Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for today, and thank you, God, for this lesson that we're about to go and embark upon. Bless us, Lord, as it gives us fuel for the fire, and allows us, Lord, to be motivated, to be encouraged, to be guided, to be led by your Spirit. Bless us in every way, and give us what we need, Lord, on the journey of life, and God, we'll be careful to give your name, praise, honor, and glory, which is due. Bless us now and keep us in every way. Allow us to be intentional, O oh God, about your word. So that, Lord, truly it becomes a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Bless us now and keep us in every way. For it's in your son's name we pray, Jesus the Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. So with that being said, I want to get into our lesson today again. Ezekiel, street preacher to the exiles. Um, aim for change. Uh, and again, it's, the scripture is coming from Ezekiel 18, verses 1 through 9 and verses 30. Through 32 in the same chapter of Ezekiel 18. And um, the um, aim for change reads, by the end of this lesson, we will examine behavior in which we blame others as the cause, commit to be responsible for our own behavior, and engage in responsible behavior that finds favor with God. And our in focus reads this way. It says, Alex and Andrew grew up watching their father, Mason, come home drunk. Sometimes Mason would scream at their mom or them or sometimes just go to bed to sleep it off. They saw him miss work because of hangovers and then have nothing and then have nothing to do in the evening but drink some more. When Andrew moved out of the house, he prided himself on how he could drink responsibly. He would go out for drinks with the guys after work and enjoy himself at a weekend party. It was hard living on his own, though and though and soon his, his treat of a nightcap turned to more and more drinking. Andrew was worried about what he saw his own life becoming. But what could he do? He had never had a positive role model to show him how to deal with life's hardships. His dad had been an alcoholic, and now he has, now he was borderline too. What had anyone really expected to happen? Alex watched as his brother uh, descended into the same path their father did. Even though Alex was the spitting image of his dad, they were very different in temperament. Knowing that he would likely have a problem with alcohol if he tried it, he decided to completely abstain. There were plenty of fun things to do with his friends that didn't involve drinks. And how have you followed in your parents' footsteps? When have you decided specifically to not follow their example? 
And I will tell you uh, this, and I will kind of I will be somewhat transparent uh, in this regard. Uh, there's some things, especially um, as I grew up, um, that I saw uh, uh, particular particular loved ones do. Uh, they could have been parents, they could have been aunts and uncles, they could have been a host of things. Um, but I made I kind of made a decision in my mind for certain for many reasons that I would not embark upon those things. Uh, certain things that I saw that just, just didn't it didn't look right, didn't seem right, and really it wasn't it wasn't right. And when I became older, some of those things I indulged in, okay. Um, but I also also chin checked myself and 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 really began the process of thinking about my own relationship with God. And I said, you know what? Why am I doing this? Um, who is it pleasing? Uh, who is it destroying? Because really, it's probably destroying myself, and I don't even really realize it. Um, and so, with that, there's activities that I just decided to negate from, pull back from, um, because I saw where some of my family members had gone with some of these same problems. Okay, I'm speaking specifically about alcohol. That's what I'm speaking of. Um, and I never have been an alcoholic or uh, in that regard. However, I've seen what alcohol can do. Uh, two family members, if they allow themselves to get caught up in it. And that goes for any sin, okay? Let me be clear on that. Because if you indulge yourself in any type of sin, what it's ultimately going to do is going to pull you down in some way, shape, fashion, or form. And it's going to pull others uh, that you have, that you say you love around you, is going to pull them down as well. Even if they don't know you're doing it. So this is why it's important that we uh, begin the process of understanding, um, you know, when we look at our lives or whatnot, Sometimes our best example is what we've seen in the past that other people have done. You know, when, when you see someone who has been downtrodden and, and, um, and they continue to drink their lives away, um, you, know, by, you know, by alcohol, if you will, or even using controlled substances, it can be any, it can be any level of sin. Um, I'm not isolating it to just, you know, drinking or drugs or anything of that nature, but it can be any sin. But when you see that and you realize there's something innately not right about it, don't 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 partake in it, because one of the one things one of the things about sin sin is very easy, okay. Sin it is sin is very easy whether we wish to embark upon it voluntarily or we use it use it uh, voluntarily as a vice, as a vice in order to compensate for another area of our lives that we think is really bad, rather than treating the area of our lives with something that is constructive and positive rather than something that is destructive. So now you already have one destructive area in your life and you're taking another destructive thing in order to try to cope with that destructive thing, not realizing that the thing that you're taking is also destroying you too. So now you got two devils you're dealing with instead of one. So this is important from the perspective of um, realizing our own lives. And again, I think a lot of times we see our greatest, the greatest mistakes that can be made in life, unfortunately, through what other folks have done, unfortunately. Okay, we pray that God has delivered them from it, but we see that thing of what not to do. And we need to point that out within our spirit, not point at them, but point at us and say, that's something I don't want to embark upon because I see the effects of it and how it can bring you to the place of destruction. Remember what John 10 and 10 says, the thief comes in only to kill, to steal, and to destroy. That's what Jesus said. But Jesus said, I came that you might have life and life more abundantly. We need to keep our mind set to the things of life. To those things that are above and not beneath. And so let's, let's make a point to be, be able to do that, uh, even if it's looking at past examples, um, uh, even of parents, uncles, and family members, and so forth, that unfortunately had went down that wrong path. We pray that they got back on the right path, but we saw the destructive pattern that those things actually lent to their lives, and we don't want that for our lives, okay? And God doesn't want that uh, for our lives. So let's just keep that in mind as we go through uh, life and go even go through the lesson on today. Our keep in mind scripture for this lesson says, for all people are mine to judge, both parents and children alike. And this is my rule, the person who sins is the one who will die. Ezekiel 18 and four out of the New Living Translation. Let's go through our um, background um, 
background to get a, a background of our text, especially when you start dealing with these Old Testament books, especially the, uh, the prophetical books. Uh, there's a lot of pieces and parts that are in it, and uh, sometimes it calls for a lot of explanation uh, when you read the Old Testament. I am, I am very partial to the Old Testament. Uh, anyone who knows me knows that. I tell people that. I love the Old Testament because of how it speaks to the new. Uh, I, I think I get a better revelation of Christ when I read the Old Testament and when I read the books of the Old Testament, especially the prophetical books. So the background says this. The prophet Ezekiel lived during the Babylonian exile and was active as a prophet for approximately 20 years from 596 BC, me, 593 BC to at least 573 BC. Ezekiel lived as an exile according to the title of the book that bears his name, Ezekiel 1, 1 through 2. He was carried away as a captive with Jehoiakim, um, 2 Kings 24, 14 through 16, in about 597 BC. His prophetic call came to him in the fifth year of Jehoiachin's uh, captivity. Ezekiel held a prominent um, place among the exiles and was frequently consulted by the elders. Ezekiel 8 and 1, Ezekiel 8, uh, excuse me, Ezekiel 11 and 25, Ezekiel 14 and 1, and Ezekiel 20 and 1. In the ninth year of his exile, he lost his wife by some sudden and unforeseen tragedy. Um, that's Ezekiel 8 and 1, Ezekiel 24 and 1, and Ezekiel 18. Oh, excuse me, Ezekiel 24 and 1, and Ezekiel 24 and 18. According to the information in the book's opening, he was the son of the priest uh, uh, Buzi, one, um, Ezekiel 1 and 3, and his name in Hebrew meant God strengthens this child, or, or possibly God, may God strengthen this person. Because he was of a priestly family, he probably had a good education, especially in the law. And his father may even have had some influence in Jerusalem. The time and manner of his death are unknown. And so we have that background here. We're going to go through our scripture and read through it um, thusly on today. And I'm reading from the New Living Translation that's in our uh, book. And again, for those that may be joining us or will join us, we use Precepts for Living by the Urban Ministries Institute. Awesome book, especially in the African diaspora, meaning uh, those who are in African-American churches. doesn't matter the denomination, uh, but I know individuals that uh, are in the AME Zion Church, AME Church that use this book. We're a Baptist church, and we use it. Uh, Precepts of Living is great. It is real live talk, and, um, and it really it, it speaks to our context. Uh, so this is why we use it. Uh, we've used this book, I think, First Mount Zion has used this book forever, and um, we continue to use it. And even when I came, became pastor of this church, and I saw the education materials for Christian education, and I saw this, I didn't even, I didn't even flinch. I said, we don't need to change this. I said, because I know about this book um, and the writers that um, publish it. I said, they do an awesome job. They're biblically accurate. Um, and also, they're very relevant to our context in being African-American. So with that, um, I can, we continue to use uh, this book, and we will continue to use this book, because I don't think we're going to change from it anytime soon. So with that, I want to read our text out of Ezekiel 18, 1 through 9, and then verses 30 through 32. Out of Ezekiel 18 and 1, it reads thusly. Then another message came to me from the Lord. Why do you quote this proverb concerning the land of Israel? Parents have eaten sour grapes, but their children's mouths pucker at the taste. As surely as I live, says the sovereign Lord, you will not quote this proverb anymore in Israel. For all people are mine to judge, both parents and children alike. And this is my rule. The person who sins is the one who will die. Suppose a certain man is righteous and does what is just and right. He does not feast in the mountains before Israel's idols or worship them. He does not commit adultery or have intercourse with the woman during her menstrual period. 
He is a, he is a merciful, merciful uh, creditor, not keeping the items given as security by poor debtors. He does not rob the poor, but instead gives food to the hungry and provides clothes for the needy. He grants loans without interest, stays away from injustice, is honest and fair when judging others, and faithfully obeys my decrees and regulations. Anyone who does these things is just and will surely live, says the Sovereign Lord. Verse 30. Therefore I will judge each of you, O people of Israel, according to your actions, says the Sovereign Lord. Repent and turn from your sins. Don't let them destroy you, but uh, put all your rebellion behind you and find yourselves a new heart and a new spirit for why should you die O people of Israel I don't want you to die says the sovereign Lord turn back and live and may the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his holy word let's get into our text on today so what it says here is it says um, God reminds Judah of his sovereignty uh, God reminds Judah of his, uh, the tribe of Judah of his sovereignty uh, in Ezekiel 18, 1 through 4. Let me read what the commentator writer says here um, as we go through our text. The prophets had warned of God's judgment for generations. Because of that, the captives blamed their ancestors for their problems. They complained that God was punishing them for something their parents had done. Quoting an old Jewish proverb, often used when a person was having trouble and it didn't seem like he'd done anything to deserve it. They failed to realize they were even more worse than their ancestors in Jeremiah 16 and 12. They remembered only the sins of the past, forgetting their sins of the present, and, um, and forgetting their sins of the present. Some white Americans tend to have a similar problem, okay? They readily admit the past sin of slavery, but protest that they had nothing to do with it. They complain about the demands of blacks forgetting their present injustice. God forbade Judah's complaining. First, he reminded them that he is God. He is in charge. And if the people were living in faith, they would recognize his work. Even when people rebel, God is in charge of their souls. Second, he assures them that only those individuals who rebel against God will die. He is not unjust. Out of mercy, God waited for generations, lo looking for repentance. Finally, he had to send his judgment. Each individual soul is responsible for, for its own sin and will be judged accordingly. The question here says, why do we often feel we are being punished for someone else's missteps. Woo. Why do we often feel we are being punished for someone else's missteps? Okay? So with that question, I think that's something that we oftentimes have to, I think, think about. You know, just, just really think about it. I'm going back to the scripture itself in verse 4. For all the people are mine to judge, both parents and children alike, and this is my rule. The person who sins is the one who will die. And so I want you all to understand sin is equated to death. Okay. This is something in the book of Romans. Uh, and I've never taught the book of Romans here at First Mount Zion. But it's a book eventually, uh, I think, for our Bible study Wednesday night um, that I probably will get to once I get through, get through the book of Acts that we're going through. Um, but sin is equated to death. Okay. I need you all to understand that. Because it doesn't necessarily mean that you will physically die now because you sin. But what it does say is that death is triggered even more when you do sin. Because sin in and of itself is equated to death. We always go back to the creation account with regards to the aspect of Adam and Eve, and specifically them eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil when they weren't supposed to. God told them not to, told them not to even touch the fruit, don't even touch the tree. But they did it because... They were decided to listen to what we call, what, what I've heard theologians call, specifically Dr. John Kenny from uh, Virginia Union uh, University, from their uh, seminary and divinity school, called snakeology, okay? <clears throat> snakeology versus theology, meaning that you would rather listen to the snake than listen to God. So 
they listened to the snake. And they listened to the snake, and the snake got them in trouble to the point that they sinned. God had already told them that they would surely die if they ate of the fruit. What did the snake tell them? The snake told them, said, God loves you too much to the point you won't surely die if you eat of this fruit. And they believed the snake. And, and hence, sin came into the world, sin being equated to death. This is why folks die in this world, because of the original sin of Adam and Eve. Now, I state all that based off, the, uh, based off the standpoint of the question. Again, why, why do we often feel we are being punished, punished for someone else's mishaps? Because at the end of the day, again, because of original sin, okay, there is punishment that is tied to that. However, the ultimate punishment of spiritual death, okay, a spiritual death, people think physical death is the ultimate. No, it's not physical death. Spiritual death is the ultimate. Because you don't want to spiritually die because now you now you are truly you truly belong to Satan because you did not receive the salvation of Jesus Christ while you had the opportunity and the chance to do so when you were on earth. So because of that, this is why we have to look at the standpoint of our own. And now it may seem that there are steps that, that you know, the missteps of others have attributed to some of the things that we're dealing with and having to deal with uh, and so forth. But at the same time, you have free will and you have choice. All of us do. And because of that free will and choice, the choices that we can make in life, this is why it is so important that we make the right choices in life. Okay, when we read it in focus, we, we read about all the things that we saw, the things that people did and so forth and so forth and you know and this is why we, when we see all of the wrong traps that people are falling into we can't fall into the wrong traps those are lessons those are things that we need to look at those are things that we need to examine those are things that we need to think about because god is telling us even through that wrong activity that they're doing this is wrong don't do it stay away from it it could kill you it could kill you spiritually it could kill you physically it's meant to destroy you. And I think that when we, we, when we begin to think of it that way, that's when you begin to play spiritual chess rather than playing spiritual checkers. Because anyone who knows the game of chess, chess, I, don't know how to, I personally don't know how to play chess. However, I know enough about the rules of chess to know that it is truly a thinking man's game. So you must think not just one step ahead. You have to think about the multitude of steps ab above that uh, or beyond that that would happen or things that are consequences that can happen if you make the next step that you're about to make. So this is why it is so important that we calculate the risk of sin. And when you really calculate the risk of sin, what you will find is that there's no way that you want to do or participate in sin because you can name various consequences down the road that that sin could bring you into. Okay, all right. So if I was to name, if I was to name a sin, okay, let's let's just say promiscuity. Let's just say, um, you know, let, let's let's say fornication. So if you go down that road. There are a lot of consequences that come, come with that. Um, you may not be ready to take the responsibility of a child if, um, if, a, if, a, if you get pregnant or the person you consummate with gets pregnant. Now you have a life that you have to take care of and take responsibility for when you can't take responsibility for yourself and you don't have enough maturity or maturation in your own spirit to even come to that place. Okay, what, what else does it do? If you had aspirations of various things, those things may now need to be put placed on hold and you don't want to put them on hold, but they may have to be put on hold for you to take care of a responsibility that you, that you created based off, again, something that God already told you not to do. <clears throat> this is weighing the risk, okay? Weighing the risk of, of, of um, certain transmitted diseases due to sex, okay? You would have contract one. Now you got to deal with that. Okay? So think these are things, again, consequences, spiritual chess versus spiritual checkers. 
So you're thinking down the road of all the multitude of things that could possibly happen if you were to indulge in the something that God said don't do. Okay? Um, I'm hoping folks are hearing me and hearing what I'm saying uh, from the perspective today and thank God for what, uh, again, he's doing. Uh, thank God for those that are joining, um, that joined before and also are joining now. Thank God for you. Uh, and good morning to you all today. Um, so these are things that I think we need to, to really take uh, into consideration and to really, really, really think about as we think about our lives uh, when, it, when it, we think, think about the punishment of what sin can bring in our lives, okay? Something again to think about, something just to think about and ponder because God wants us to be thinking about his word, okay? Think about his word. Again, I've heard this from several preachers before, and I, I, I I'll repeat this. I heard this thing from uh, Reverend Dr. Howard John Wesley of Alexandria, Virginia. Uh, again, you don't have to believe, you don't have to think how I think. <clears throat> you just need to be thinking. Think about what God has said. Think about what God has instituted, what God has put protection and provision around. What has God told us? And because of that, all of what he's given us it's because of the love he has for us to keep us protected. Just something to think about. So with that being said, let me go into our second part, verses 5 through 9. Let me read this. Suppose a certain man is righteous and does what is just and right. He does not feast in the mountains before it, uh, Israel's idols or worship them. He does not commit adultery or have intercourse with a woman during the menstrual period. He is a merciful creditor, not keeping the items given as security by poor debtors. He does not rob the poor, but instead gives food to the hungry and provides clothes for the needy. He grants loans without interest, stays away from injustice, is honest and fair when judging others. Verse 9, and faithfully obeys my decrees and regulations. Anyone who does these things is just and will surely live says the sovereign Lord. Let me read the commentator writer here as the commentator writer gets into it a little bit deeper. However, just because a person has a right to stand as an individual in God's hand, in God's hand, doesn't mean all his problems are over. <clears throat> Excuse me. It means he's got to stick to the standards. It means he's got to uphold the law. If you don't want to stand there with your knees wobbling, if you don't want to stand there with fear and trembling, you're going to have to do your bit to live in God's way. The greatest of the commandments is to love the Lord your God, to love your neighbor as yourself. The examples of the commandments we should keep, uh, chapter 18, verse 6 through 8 of the book of Ezekiel, quite naturally fit both categories, loving God and loving our neighbor. God never intended anything else. And the question here that's asked is how do you remind yourself what, the, how do you remind yourself what the right thing to do is? Let me say that again. How do you remind yourself what the right thing to do is? For me, the chin check is always what would Jesus do? <laughs> That's always the chin check. Would Jesus do this? Did Jesus teach against it? Did Jesus teach for it? What would Jesus do in the situation? I always ask myself that question because that is the standard. Jesus Christ was our model. And because he was and is our model, that's why I often ask myself that question. <clears throat> so to remind myself of what it is to do right in the sight of the Lord is to truly look at the Lord and to look at what the Lord says. And that's why, my, for me, that is always the chin check. Um, would Jesus do this? You know, is this something that Jesus taught against? Is this something that Jesus taught for? The answers to those questions often will lead me and guide me into whatever decision I'm going to make based on those questions, okay? For you, it, it may be various things. It may, may be just biblically what you see. I, you know, you go to God's word and, 
And, you know, I know God, you know, told us not to do this. And so I told, the, we know that God told us to do this. And so because of that, we're gonna, I'm going to work towards that. So this is why it is so important, you know, and I like the reference that the commentator writer gives. He says, goes back to um, what Jesus told his disciples. He said, uh, truly, he said, you know, you've heard, love the Lord your God uh, with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. For the law and the prophets is basically um, achieved by those two. Okay? So when you hear that, again, love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself, that now becomes a holistic approach to how you operate in regards to dealings with individuals, people, uh, people with society, with the world. So we love God, but we love our neighbors as much as we love us. So the question becomes, how are you treating your neighbors? Because if you're not treating your neighbors well, then you must not love yourself too well or too much. Ah, think about that. How you treat others, truly, it says, love the Lord your God, by your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength, but also love your neighbors as you love yourself. And if you don't have enough love for yourself, how do you think you're going to have love for anybody else around you? That's why it is so important that we, again, go back to what Jesus has told us, what God has instructed and led through the Holy Spirit, how we have been directed and how the word of God speaks to us even now from the perspective of what, we look, what it looks like in order to teach, preach, to live, to embody the word of God. What does that look like? And then to remind yourself Again, as the question had asked, how do you remind yourself what the right thing to do is? I'm going to help you with something on today. Um, put this in your devotional for this week. Read the entirety of Romans chapter 7. I'm going to tell you, it'll bless your soul. Read the entirety of Romans in the New Testament, Romans chapter 7. It will change your life. And it's some of the most realest talk in the Bible about you, about me, about all of us. It's almost a conversation that you're going to have with yourself about how well, about how well you're doing in this life and what you need to improve on. Again, I give you that for free. Just read it in your devotional time this week. Trust me, it will bless your soul. Let's go a little further here. We're going to our last verses and so forth for, for today. Verse um, 30 through 32 of Ezekiel 18. Therefore I will judge each of you, people of Israel, according to, according to your action, says the sovereign Lord. Repent and turn from your sins. Don't let them destroy you. Put all your rebellion behind you. Find yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. For why should you die, O people of Israel? I don't want you to die, says the sovereign Lord. Turn back and live. And I want to read this from the commentator writer and give some uh, commentary to it. God reminds them of their personal responsibility. Look at that. God does not enjoy punishing the wicked. He sends punishment so the wicked will repent. When they, re when they do repent, he gives them life and hope. Repentance works in reverse too. The previously righteous man who turns to a wicked life opens himself to God's judgment. God concluded his co comments with a promise. If any wicked man would turn from his wicked ways, his life would be saved. The choice was theirs. Why do you want to die? God cried, seek me and live. This is Deuteronomy 30 and 19, also Amos chapter 5, verse 4. Hinting at the coming gospel of Jesus Christ, God promised a new heart and new spirit to any who would live in faithful obedience to him. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, 
the Christian has an even better opportunity to live righteously than the people of Judah during the time of Ezekiel. But modern Christians have the same problem that Ezekiel's hearers had. They had an attitude of self-righteousness, complaining about the sins of others without examining themselves. And the question here says, why do, why do we not do the right thing even after we are given good advice? Why do we not do the right thing even after we are given godly advice? advice and the main reason for this my brothers and sisters of Christ is that we are not willing to take responsibility for ourselves we would rather point the finger at someone else rather than realizing that the finger also is pointing right back at us for the things that God wants to improve upon in our lives I gave you Romans chapter 7 as a devotional for this week. I'm going to go ahead and read this because this question right here really deals with it. I'm going to pull my Bible out and actually go through it on, to, on, on this uh, morning. Romans chapter 7. And I'm going to read it through its entirety because the, the, uh, this, this passage of scripture is heavy. Okay. I'm going to start at verse 7 and I'm going to read through the entirety. I want you just to listen to what God is saying in the midst of uh, this, this particular text. Romans chapter 7 beginning at verse 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sinful? Certainly not. Nevertheless, I would not have known what sin, what sin was had it not been for the law. For I would, have, would not have known what, what coveting really was if the law had not said, you shall not covet. But sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, produced in me every kind of coveting. For apart from the law, sin was dead. Once I was alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin sprang to life and I died. I found that the very commandment that was intended to bring life actually brought death. For sin, for sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, deceived me. And through the commandment put me to death. So then the law is holy. And the commandment is holy. Righteous and good. Did that which is good then become death to me? By no means. Nevertheless, in order that sin might be recognized as sin, it used what, what is good to bring about my death. So that through the commandment, sin might become utterly sinful. We know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it, it is sin living in me. For I, know that good, for I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do, do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin, it is sin living in me that does it. So I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. What a wretched man I am. 
who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself in my mind am a slave to God's law, but in my sinful nature a slave to the law of sin. This is the battle that Paul is talking about of again of sin and, and sin that leads to death but also God's law that leads to life, but also it's God's law that puts sin on pronouncement, uh, makes an announcement in regards to sin, saying that sin leads you to death. So when you know what sin is, you know that sin is equated to death because the law led you, led you to the knowledge and the truth that sin leads you to death. I hope this makes sense. Because that law of God, law of God is what he wants inside of us in order for us not to bow down to the law of sin. Because the law of sin only produces death, but the law of God produces life by way of pronouncing death, <clears throat> pronouncing that sin is death, but also pronouncing that we can have life eternal if we stick to adhere to God's law. I know this has a, has a lot of back and forth in it, but essentially what we're reading in, in, in Ezekiel in, our, in this lesson also makes sense as well from that perspective. And I believe that when we come to that understanding of, the to me, the simplicity of knowing that sin is equated to death, there's a law working in us because of our sinful nature. Remember that. Remember, we were born in sin. So because there's a law working in us that wants us to give ourselves over to sin, God's law says, come over that you might have life. And if we, glean, if we glean ourselves and yield ourselves over to God's law, then we... And we have a less propensity, if you will, to lean over to the law of sin. That is part of us. But this is why we accepted Christ to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, does that say that we don't sin? It doesn't say that. We still go through the process of sinning. However, the knowledge of God's law and the acceptance of his salvation through Jesus Christ should lead us more towards life and away from doing sin. I hope that makes sense. This is why as human beings, we are so dependent on God's salvation. We're so dependent on God's guidance because of the law of sin that tries to continue to work in us and that Satan tries to use to play against us in order for us to do more sin rather to, to commit more sin rather than to bring sin to the forefront of the cross and the resurrection of Jesus Christ and to repent of that to still live our, to live our lives in a more productive way where sin isn't included in that equation or the amount of sin is not a, uh, or the level of sin or the amount of sin is not um, tied to that, that equation, that we are living our lives according to God's law and we're leaning more in that direction rather, to, that, rather than towards sin, which sin leads ultimately to death, physically, spiritually, and everything else. We're associated with death. It leads us to that place of death. Sin is separation from God. And that's why I, I, I use the mirrorism with my hands that sins over here, God's laws over here, because it's separated. Just as if or when God separated light from darkness. Same thing. Life from, from death. Okay? Separation. There's no intermingling or intertwining of the two. This is what Jesus speaks of in Revelation in regards to uh, I, would rather, I would rather for you to be hot or cold, not lukewarm. Okay? I pray that this has blessed you on today. I'm going to actually stop there um, with our lesson today. Uh, 
I, I want to um, encourage all of you um, as we continue to go down God's road that we continue to adhere to his lessons, continue to adhere to his statutes, continue to adhere to his word. Hmm. I, I, want, I want to bless your soul with something very quickly um, for these last few minutes, um, as the Spirit of God will allow. Um, many of you heard of, um, especially right after um, a lot of the BLM marches, Black Lives Matter marches uh, that were going on, um, last year, it was just a difficult year because of the pandemic, but me and my family, we did, we were able to, to, to skip away and get down to Charleston, South Carolina, not far from Charlotte, about a three hour drive or so, some beaches down there. We needed to get away. The pandemic had us all housed up and you know that as well because it had you housed up as well. And so while we were down there, we didn't realize on that day that the statue of Jim Calhoun, segregationist, segregationist loyalist, um, key person in the aspect of the Confederacy, that his statue on Calhoun Street was being basically taken away. Because the country was starting and beginning to start to realize that we can't live in the past when we're saying that the past is defeated. Can't live in a, in a world where we say that, that, that truly segregation and racism, that we're trying to conquer it while having statues of those who promoted it all around the South and all around the country, that we began to come to a place where all of those things still remain. Even in my right outside of my hometown of Eden, North Carolina, there was a statue in Reedsville, North Carolina, ten miles south of my hometown, that was on a that was on a uh, semicircle, you know, roundabout on the traffic, and it was a statue there that was glorifying a Confederate soldier in honor of the Confederate Army who was defeated in the Civil War. It oftentimes makes me wonder sometimes, it makes me think about the perspective of life and how we think about certain things and why we give so much glory to things that are dead. I want you to stay with me just for a little while. I, I'm just going to preach for a little while, not, not long. Why are we dwelling on dead things and giving glory to something that we say should be buried? And I, I thought about that and been thinking about that uh, for really the past year and uh, something came up this week that I saw online that made uh, a lot of sense to me, okay? Made a lot of sense to me and I had to really think about this and a young lady began to talk and she said uh, essentially some of the same things that I'm saying but um, what happened at that place in... Uh, where John uh, Calhoun's statue was being lifted, um, there was also a Confederate flag that was floating right there beside of the statue of John Calhoun. And while they removed the statue, they allowed the Confederate flag to stand, which didn't make sense at all because if you're going to bury the past, then you need to bury all of it. Don't try to resurrect some of it and leave some of it alive in order to tarnish so many other minds, bodies, and spirits in the present place we're living. If you want to talk about redemption, let's be redeemed. Quit bringing Satan back into the same fold that we've been into and leaving sin behind, leaving relics of uh, disdainment and separation and segregation and discrimination aside. This is the thing that has has culminated in all the things that we're seeing now, but we still allow certain things to live when we say they're dead. Now I wonder sometimes, even with that, how much of our countenance is tied up into dead things rather than burying the dead and focusing on what's alive. 
So with the story, the woman goes and says um, that there was an individual, certain individuals, and we know of this woman who actually climbed and said, I'm going to take that flag down, down in Charleston. So what she did was they went and it was her and a, a white man uh, that uh, was with them that agreed with what they were doing. Okay. So he was part of the plan. So what they did was she went up, they had breakfast, they walked up the Calhoun Street, they went up to that Confederate flag that was beside the old John Calhoun statue. When they went up, she climbed up there and she went up to get that flag and to take that flag down. And so the white man that was with her in agreement with her, he stood right there by the flagpole. So when the police showed up, they were ready to, they couldn't fire shots at her. Because it wasn't worth her being killed for what she was doing. But one of the police officers said, well, all we need to do is, is tase the pole that she's on because the pole she's on is made of metal. And if we tase the pole, it will shock her and she will have no recourse but to let go and she would fall probably to the demise of her death. And so knowing this, the white man who was in agreement with the woman who went up to get the flag off, the Confederate flag off of the flagpole, come, came to some level of realization that his part now needed to be played. Because he could have just as well ran off when the cops showed up. But he didn't. Because there's a difference, church, between an ally and a co-conspirator. I'll get to that in a second. But when he saw what the officers were planning to do to take electric tasers and to shoot the, the, the flagpole so that she would be shot and ultimately let go and fall to a possible death, this white man took his arm and began to lean on the pole. And they began to pull their tasers out and they told him, you need to let go of that pole because we're about to shock it. And the man stood there with his hand on the pole and he said, well, if you shock, if you shock this pole, that means you're going to shock me. And you're probably going to kill me along with her. So I'm going to stand right here because I believe what she's doing is the right thing. So if you shock this pole, you're not just going to kill one today, you're going to kill two. That were standing for the right thing, that were standing for justice, that were standing for honesty, that were standing for the justice of God in that place. And I want to tell somebody today, if there are individuals in your life that aren't willing to stand up for what's good, what's right, what's virtuous, what those things of God that have, that have pleasure, that bring him happiness, that bring him joy, those things of God that bring, again, justice for all, that bring the encapsulation of our spirit to a greater uh, aspect of not being unimportant, not being inconsequential, not being who we, uh, who people would think we are not, or to devalue our very existence as African Americans in this country. That's why you can have allies all day, but you don't need an ally, you need a co-conspirator. Because a co-conspirator means that I not only pass legislation for you, but I will stand right there with you. And when they try to kill you, that means they're going to have to kill me too. And I want you to know today that God is more than your ally. Christ is more than just your friend. Christ is a co-conspirator. And know for a fact that Christ is standing right by you when you least expect it. If you're doing right for God, know that God is right there with you. And know that if you're going to take on some suffering, know that Christ has already paid the price for you. In the life we live and in the situations we deal with continuously. Personally, 
I don't need an ally. I need somebody who's going to be a co-conspirator. A person who's going to stand. And when the mud gets thick, they're standing in there right with me. This is the world we're in today. And I challenge every one of us in Christendom, everyone who claims Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of their life, if you're not willing to stand for something, to stand with somebody who stands for something, then you will fall for anything and you will die for nothing. Don't be an ally. Don't be one that says and talks a good game, but when the rubber meets the road, you're not ready for the protest. You're not there to march. Or you're not there to even possibly lose your life because you know the person who you agree with could possibly lose theirs. This is why it's important in, in, in the Christian church. Pastors truly be an under shepherd. That whatever happens to you Whatever happens to them could possibly happen to you. This is why this is important. This is a mini sermon that I really didn't need a scripture for it, but I want to speak from the perspective of where we are right now in our world. I don't need you to be an ally for me. I need you to be a co-conspirator. Stand by that flag. Stand by me as a Christian. Stand by me as a black man. And say I'm with you brother. Because what they have been doing to your people has been wrong. As a matter of fact, I've been wrong for not standing with you all this time. I need a co-conspirator. Because co-conspirators want to stand up for what is right what is holy, what is godly, and what's of Christ. Keep that in your mind this week. And when someone says, you know what, you're right, I want to stand with you, stand beside you, you ask them the question, are you willing to go 50% or are you willing to go the whole 100? Because if you're only willing to go 50 you're not a co-conspirator. You're just an ally. May God bless you. May heaven smile upon you on today. First Mount Zion family, God bless you. Again, more information will come with regards to our re-entry plan. Um, me and the deacons are meeting this coming weekend, as a matter of fact. And we're going to be talking that through and looking at what that will entail. Again, we're close. We just got to finish it through and to make sure that folks are safe before we re-enter this space on 1515 Remount Road. I love you in the Lord. This is all of our time for today that I'm going to take. Amen. Have an awesome day. Have a wonderful day. I want to close in a word of prayer and allow us to have space for the Sabbath. Allow God to work through us and allow God to minister through us, to strengthen us for the course of this week. And also remember that you don't need allies. You need co-conspirators. You need those who are going to stand in the gap with you, not just intercede, but stand with you in the midst of troubling times. Jesus has always been a co-conspirator. The question is, those who, follow, who are following Jesus or who say they follow Jesus, will they be co-conspirators with you, knowing that the word of God is true, just, and right? And if it is so, which we know it is, that they are willing to stand up for it regardless of what they may possibly lose. May God bless you. May heaven smile upon you. Let us pray at this time. Father God, we thank you and praise you, Lord, for this day. We thank you, God, for this time. We thank you, Lord, for the lessons that we've learned. Lord, for Lord, you being a co-conspirator and not just an ally with us, God. Thank you, Lord, for this day and time. We're living in troubling times, God. We need those who are willing to be real about this ministry of Jesus Christ, especially as it calls, to, calls for us to stand on justice. 
And as Amos said, justice may roll down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. We ask, Father, that you bless and keep us, Lord. On today, allow us to see your glory, O oh God, as we proceed through this week. Give us the strength necessary to deal with the hellhounds of life. And God, we'll be careful, Lord, to make sure that our words, our speech, our actions all line up to your word. Bless us and keep us in every way. And we'll be careful to give your name, praise, honor, and glory because it is due every day. We love you and praise you, Lord. It's in your son's name we pray, Jesus the Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. This is Pastor Hagwood, pastor of First Mount Zion Mary Baptist Church in Charlotte, North Carolina, where we are exalting Christ to restore, renew, and rebuild people to serve the kingdom of God. God's blessings to you. Take care. Be blessed. We love you in the Lord, and there is nothing that you can do about that. We love you. Take care, and be blessed on today.